thank you so much for joining in my first show of episode one of let's talk fashion and motivation it's your girl denise brown stylist now if you guys don't know about me i'm a freelance fashion stylist I'm also a speaker and I'm a mentor and I'm a teacher. And I've been a fashion stylist for more than 10 years. I style celebrities, I do editorials, I start do personal shopping, and I also mentor young people from the age of 16 to 25 in the care system. I'm a teacher and I'm also a speaker. Hi, I'm so happy that you guys tuned in. Um, just today, I'm so excited about the show because I'm gonna be interviewing photographer Kosha at Femel. Now I'm going to speak a little bit about Kosha because I met Kosha about 14 years ago and I remember he used to be a mentor and this is the first time that I actually spoke to someone and said, look, I want to become a mentor and mentor young people in the care system. And at that time, he was working in Brixton and he was one of the reasons why I started to mentor kids and teach fashion. He helped me with my scheme of work and I'm just so happy to have him today because if it wasn't because of him, I would have never, ever been able to teach young people in Brixton because I used to work with neats and I used to teach them fashion, gang members, all different, just people from different backgrounds. So guys, I go, where are you, Kosha? <laughs> Trying to look for him. Kosha, where are you? Right, guys. For Kosha at the moment, but... I hope you guys are fine and I hope you've had a good Sunday so far. Trust me. Hey, what's going on, Kosha? What's happening? What's, happening? what's, happening? what's, happening? what's going on? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice introduction, huh? huh? Nice introduction. Oh, listen. Do you know what? I just want to. Do you know what it is? Coach, I'm just waiting for Kosha at the moment. But I hope you guys are fine and I hope you've had a good Sunday so far. Trust me. Hey, what's going on, Kosha? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? What's going on? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice introduction, huh? Huh? Nice introduction. Oh, listen. Do you know what? I just want to... Do you know what it is, Kosha? If it wasn't because of you, and I, that's what I want to say, I want to say a big thank you because I remember I spoke to you and I was like, you know what? I want to be a mentor. And I remember the time when I was practising and I was like, this is what I'm going to do. And I was scared and I was like, eh, 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 stutting. And he was like, no, Denise, just take your time. And you know what? If it wasn't because of you, you are, as I said, you're, it's because of you. That's how I started to do this whole mentoring, teaching young people in the care system. And also, you know, just neats and gangs. And then it went on from there. But I just want to start off with, thank you so much, Kosha, for coming on my first episode. You don't have to correct me. It's an honour, it's a pl- privilege and it's a pleasure. So, oh, wicked. And I just want you to tell the people who you are. Mm, that's a good question. What do you mean, who I am? So, in regards to um, where I'm coming from? Yeah, if you can just tell us who you are and where you're coming from. All right, let's start from, can we start from your teenage years of how you actually, let's start from your teenage years because I know that you've done a lot of different things in your teenage years, like from music. So let's start about this. Let's start with... Right, so you want to go way back. You want to go from the beginning, beginning, but quicker. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we, do you know what we can do? We can actually start like if you just tell the um the viewers what do you do at the moment, and then we can start back from go back. All right. So basically, right now, um, it's your boy, Mr. Kosha Osayal, <laughs> um, um, official owner of Femel Studios, Flash Studio Seventy Seven. I am considered probably from the past what let's say fourteen years known as a photographer. So I do fashion, editorial, beauty. Um, but I started out in glamour, um, doing urban glamour. Um, and yeah, so that's where I'm at now. So I'm in my studio. We had a shoot early today. So that finished at five, gave me an hour to get myself suited and ready for the interview. Um, and yeah, that's, that's it. And I dabble in a little bit of music management. So I've also got a music management page called Cerebro Artist Management. So I was looking after a young artist um recently doing some music stuff on that but yes that's where i'm at now okay um, where i'm coming from boy if you want to go back to teenage years real quick so my background is that um i started out as a dancer when i was probably about i want to say 13 going onwards and then me and my... i can't hear you i can eat talk a bit louder Get my tea while I'm for people like Rampage, Westwood, Boogie Bunch, 
Um, and then from just being a dance member, going to choreography, uh, I, I was dancing for a, a young artist school, QT. So she was a girl from South, Southeast London, she had a record deal, her uh, biggest song was a track called Africa. So we was dancing for her, me and my partner, Grezzo. Um, and then from dancing for her, her management saw that we could rap. So then we got a record deal um, as rappers. So then from rapping, that then led on to um, promotion. So all the time, I've, basically everything just was a natural progression where I'm at now, if that makes sense. So we was rapping, and then along the way of the rapping stuff, that was all good. And then we had a, 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 a good situation about to happen where I was about to, the group, the group was called Bloodhounds, by the way. So old school head, if you're going back to the mid 90s, 93, 94, 95, and maybe a little bit before, then that's my generation of MCs. So big shout out to MC Ty, RIP. Um, oh. all, the, all the, those people there, they know who they are. Yeah. So if you know people like Skinny Man, my family, yeah, um, yeah. Breeze, Roots Manuva, Black Twang, those kind of groups, those kind of people, MCD, those kind of people, that's my era, that's my genre of hip hop, UK. And then from there, basically, we had on the table, we had two deals. We had a situation where we could have gone to America and got signed with Nick by Nature, or we could have gone and got signed by Father MC. Um, and at that time, I was about, I was 18 years old, and I just found out that I was about to have a child. So, wow. yeah, that's what I'm saying. So basically, <laughs> I had to make a choice. Am I going to see my dreams of being an international rapper and an MC, or do I stay as a teenage boy and try and be a dad to my child? So that's what I did. I stayed. So I stayed in the UK. Okay. Um, one of my partners in the group, he left. He's living large, doing his thing in America right now. Big up Drezzo. Um, he married into the Epicermon family. He's married to Epicermon's sister, doing big things in the States. But I stayed, and then I was still rapping, but the group had obviously split. So I then kind of naturally, I, I became a base of a, a battling. So I was battling. Wow. And off the back of the battling, I created a club night called Cream of the Crop. So Cream of the Crop was the first ever battle night in the UK. So if you think of Eminem and 8 Mile, the film 8 Mile, mm. he was doing that 10 years before the movie came out. So wow. the first spot was in Camden Town or WKD. And after that, we moved it to um, this place in Vauxhall called The Dungeon and a few other places. While I was doing that, I was also involved in a music school. So I wanted, I wanted to do the thing. So myself, I'm going to say myself. So basically, there's a guy called Adima, um, Michael Lord. So he was an American brother who said that he went to set up a hip hop school. Your voice is going so in and out, now. Your voice is. Your, go your yeah, voice is going so in and out. When yeah, I approached yeah. Ty and myself, he wanted us to come and teach, basically. So we were looking at him like, really? We're going to be teaching people how to rap? All right, cool, let's do it. So we did that, and that was called Ghetto Grammar. So we built Ghetto Grammar mm. from scratch. We had two locations, one in Vauxhall, one in Farringdon. And we were teaching people how to basically MC. Um, and then that then evolved. So at the same time, remember, so I'm, I'm rapping here. I'm teaching here, and then the clubs are happening as well, so we the clubs. So, off of the back of that, so Ghetto Grammar was popping. Uh, one of the peaks of Ghetto Grammar for me personally, we, we had lots of interviews with the Guardian newspaper. It was on Big Breakfast. I don't know, some of you don't even know. Yeah, I remember Big Breakfast. Big Breakfast. Yeah. yeah. But we were on Big Breakfast, and um, I remember teaching Zoe Ball how to spit a few freestyle bars. Mm -mm. So, we did that, and a whole bunch of other things. And then, as the school grew, we added more elements to it. So originally it was just MCing, but then by the time we finished, we added um, DJing and we had gone into like deep wing. But really, so we had the MCing, DJing, and the breaking. And we're trying to get all four couples of the, the hip hop foundations together, but we never got to do the final part, which would have been the PEM tag. Um, so while I was doing that, some friends of mine um, and asked me, to get involved with a street promotional company. So then I got involved with the militia. So the militia was basically an independent street promotional company who were distribute um, merchandise and promo products for different record labels. 
Um, our biggest client was Tommy Boy. Tommy Boy Records, they're not a bound model, but those of you who know Tommy Boy Records, so yeah, we used to do Tommy Boy Records, and our team was crazy. The team was crazy. No one could touch the militia. We was everywhere and everywhere, and our... Oh, boy, them days out. Them days, that's the doing, days. Everybody out there, anybody... <laughs> So anybody that listens to a man like Samtex, Samtex on the radio, if you listen to who else? So Samtex, I think, was running Def Jam. And there was a couple of other brothers that was running a couple of other labels. But Samtex will remember back in the days when he was doing a street promotion stuff. So you had Militia. But for the back of Militia, what else was I doing? So then I created a night. So the MC night, the battle night was called Cream of the Crop. Mm. Then I created another night called Off the Rocks. So Off the Rocks was basically an old school. This is where... You came off the rocks, typically. So yeah, I, I used to love off music. the rocks. It's yeah. so, so off dumb. the rocks was basically an old school hip hop night where we only employed DJs that could play to a certain standard. So that's where um, we had people like Shorty Blitz, Big Ted, DJ Two Seven Nine, Snips, um, Manny Norte, a few others that would play. And, and the reason it was hard to get the, the right DJ, DJ business was because if you have real old school, hardcore, proper hip hop, you can't play it on bike. Mm. So we was doing that for a few years. So off the bus was crazy. Um, that's due to get a return, by the way. And, and the concept that we did that was nuts. Now, off the back of the rocks, um, a couple of friends approached me to help them set up a mod agency. So I'm fast forward, and this is what's going into the fashion stuff. So what's, what was the mod agency um, called, though? Huh? Your modeling agency. agency. What's the name of your modeling agency? Oh, okay, right. right. So, oh, the, the, the modeling agency, the people that approached me to help them set up their agency, they oh. called Rocket Yeah. So this time I was. Yeah, here's a disclaimer. So in my whole long-legged life, people, I think I've only ever done, I want to say, four official jobs. And what I mean by official jobs is that these are jobs where on a certain day of the month. Them guaranteed a certain amount of money. Um, you pay taxes, your national insurance number, and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. At the same time as doing those four jobs, I've always been working for myself and doing my own stuff. So since 15 from now, I've always been doing my own stuff. Yes, good. So at the time of the Off the Rocks, this is when I got into youth work. So my background was a bit mm, murky growing up as a kid. So I always wanted to be able to, if I could, I was in a position to maybe help others that came from a similar situation. Yeah. Because I felt that I could relate. And I felt that they would be able to hear where I'm coming from and maybe take some life lessons. Mm. So one of my official government jobs, I used to be a courier. I used to drive for CityLink. Wow, okay. While driving for CityLink, I used to deliver to um, Childline in in Islington. So one day at Childline, the girl said to me, oh, um, would you be interested in becoming a mentor? I said, yes. Then I became a mentor an organization called um, Mentoring Plus. So I was a mentor for a little while. For two years, I was mentoring, just as a mentor. And then at the end of the two years, the people that were in the organization saw that it was a little bit more to me than maybe just mentoring. I enjoyed the mentoring, but then I could also design stuff in programs and educational stuff. Mm. So that's what I got into, designing programs for young people to supplement their educational needs, yeah? Um, but then the programs was around other stuff. It wasn't just like the the curriculum. I was doing stuff in social awareness, relationships, gang stuff, you know, just, just life skills, basically. Um, and after working for them, I got a headhunting for an organization called um, Lambert Crime Prevention Trust. So I was there for the longest period of time. So I think I was there at Lambert Crime Prevention Trust for about 12 years. Mm. Um, and there my job was program development manager. So I used to basically design programs in my own head and then deliver the programs and teach people to teach my programs, which was beautiful. But at the same time as doing that, I had got my first, no, wait, at the same time as doing that, I had started to develop this agency for these friends. So the agency called Hot Details, we put in about, I want to say about five to six months worth of work Mm -hmm. from the concept to the paperwork to organizing their very first shoot to casting for models and everything. So after putting in all that work, I was like, I approached them and I said to them, listen, let me invest, let me put some money in, and I will, I'm happy to work by the scenes, and I will help you. But mm. they were still excited, they was like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I know they want to. I'm like, okay, that's cool, nothing's by force. But because 
we had gone through the process. And at that time, I had done so much already. So in regards to just creating and putting things in place, I kind of had a system. I kind of knew how certain things would work. So I was like, you know what? I turned to my partner, he shout out to Teresa, books, team books. Yeah. Um, and I tell my Teresa, I said, listen, let's just do it ourselves. Let's just set up our own agency. Mm. And that's the birth of the milk. Yeah. Oh. So basically, for Mel, we created for Mel because at the time we was like, okay, well, there's not enough black girls getting work in the industry. Mm. And there's very beautiful black girls, but we already know. Fast forward 2020, and we're talking about Black Lives Matter and systemic racism, and rare, rare. It's in <laughs> everything. It's done being everything, and it's going to be in everything. And things are changing, but back then, it was a problem. So mm. our influence was that we was only going to take on black girls. Um, but where it was hard was that we were focusing mainly on mainstream, editorial, and commercial models. Okay. So after doing that for about three years, we spent a lot of money. So for me, how I always approach it, I didn't tip for models or wannabe models or whatever. Like, I've always wanted to deal with people correct and legitimate. Mm. So my thing is, I'm not trying to mess nobody up. Therefore, nobody's supposed to try to mess me up. You understand? So from a model perspective, I always look at it that an agency is not supposed to charge models for anything. You understand? An agency makes their money once the models make their money. Yeah, and yeah. that's how an agency gets paid. So yeah. any models out there watching, if you go somewhere and agency will ask you, oh, yeah, yeah, but you have to pay this and you have to pay that, and you need to cheat your portfolio, it's going to cost you a thousand pounds. They're not agencies. That's <laughs> bala, 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 bala. <laughs> so, so for us, we were scout girls that we, we believe had a strong look, but then we'd have to pay a lot of money to take them to the studios and get them shot and so on and so forth. So at the time of doing that, three years in Denise, it's like, I spent out all this money. I'm not making no money. Mm. But what I am doing, I'm getting awareness. So yes. people was aware of the name of Femel, but I wasn't getting that many bookings. Okay. So I'm like, okay. But at the same time, what happened is that because I had to take the girls to so many different studios, I was meeting studios. I was seeing setups. I was meeting photographers. I was uh. meeting makeup artists. I was meeting people, creators. And it's fine. That means yeah. work. So, after doing that for three years, something significant happened. So, what happened was that, again, I'm going to go for the older people. Um, and you will remember when Channel AKA first came out. Yes, yes. Right. Very important in my story in regards to where I'm at now. So, Channel AKA came out. I can't remember what the year was. But before that, UK artists didn't have a platform to put their music or their videos, mm. videos in particular, all right? So what happened is prior to AKA, um, MTV Bass came to the UK. Um, and if you was lucky, you could get your video on there, maybe. Um, but even MTV Bass didn't really last because he came and went and he came back and he was running. You know what I'm So the, way, the guys behind the channel AKA saw a hole in the market and started to put out pure English stuff. So me now being how I am, I'm seeing a situation, I'm like, okay. So remember, back then, it's like we was getting magazines like Smooth, King, Double XL, um, Source, all those mm -hmm. American magazines were coming over, and we was, we was buying it. So we was looking at the American artists, but also, from, from my perspective, we was looking at all these American video vixens and models. Right? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, cool. So after a little while of studying Channel AKA, I was like, yeah, now there's a market. Do you get me? Yeah. So now that these young guys in England have got a platform to play their music visuals, there must now be a platform because these guys are going to need girls because, you know, within reason, we replicate what the US does. Yeah? So I was like, okay, time to switch. So two things happened. The first one was that we was like, we had gathered enough momentum in regards to the name of Femel Wonderman where me going to all these other studios realized that the studio hustle in itself was very viable. Do you understand? So the first thing was that we needed to get our own studio. So yeah. instead of spending money every week or every two weeks paying out money to get our girl shot, let's get our own studio where we would have our own photographers 
and we're not cleaning up like that no more. Mm. On top of that, we can now charge other people to come into our studio and yeah. share our studio. So yeah. So we got our first studio, which was in London Bridge on Linda Street. Um, this was in 2005. So 2005, I found this place, and it's a historic building because, it, again, this is for the grown-ups. It was a building, it's called the Hit Factory. So the Hit Factory is where people like Jason Donovan, um, Kylie Minogue, Stock Aiken and Wolverman, it was their building. So all of this history came from this building. So it was a recording studio that had offices upstairs, um, a massive recording studio, and then had a massive dance studio. So basically, we took the dance studio, I took the dance studio, and they sold it to the kitchen. So we made the dance studio into the photography studio, split out, where we had the office in one bit, and then the photography side in the other bit, and then you come out of that room, and next to it was the, the kitchen, which we made the makeup and changing. So I was like, yeah, we're good to go. At that time, Denise, I had three photographers working for me. Um, I, I had never picked up a camera. I was never interested in being a photographer. That wasn't my thing. My thing was business, yeah? So while we was there, people started to come through. So we were shooting our own girls um, and shooting clients as well. Then the Channel AKA thing was happening in the background. So slowly but surely, we figured that we need to switch the model in regards to, because it was so hard, because of the systemic system, getting high-end editorial girls placements and getting paid mm. for it, we figured it would be easier, and remember, worldwide, the one thing, two things that will beat any recession. Corona can't kill people eating food, and Corona will never kill people having sex. Sex <laughs> will always sell, food will always sell. You understand? So it's like, you know what? Let's switch the, the, the situation to um, the whole video vixen, um, glamour kind of vibe. And that's what we did. So... In 2007, we found, basically, they sold the land that our original studio was in use. And then we went over to, uh, we found a space in Elephant Castle, next to the Ministry of Sound, massive um, railway arch. So that became our home base. And when we got in there, that's when everything changed. That is so when I went over there, basically, I got rid of two of the photographers, kept one of the photographers. Um, we switched the whole thing up and started doing more glamour. And it was working, you know. After being there for a year or just under, I decided that I didn't want that the photographer no more. And the reason I didn't want the photographer no more was just purely based on come he forward. Was, he yeah, was an Italian guy. He was yeah. an Italian guy. And his lighting, I kept him based on his lighting. But his, his direction and how he would direct, I wasn't feeling it. So how it would always be is when the client would come in or somebody would come in, I would be directing the shoot. Oh, but yeah. taking pictures, you know. So I'm like, nah, this ain't really working for me, and I'm paying him good money. And then I would just think, you know, and I want to shoot. It's not a nine to five, so you might start shooting at three at mm. nine o'clock at night. You're still there on set. You know what I mean? Whereas him, because he's being paid a wage by me, he's like, oh, I've got to go. It's, it's my time. And then talking about his wife and this and that. I'm like, no, 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 I did that. So in the end, I just said to him, listen, I'm thinking about buying a camera. What camera do you think I should get? He was looking at me sideways, like, why am I about camera? <laughs> you know what that's all about already, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So he must have knew that his card was marked up. So in the end, he told me to get this camera. So when I done the research on the camera that he told me to get, I was like, but this is some dead camera, bro. So I was like, thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm going to buy this camera. So, so, dead so in the end, I, made, I got rid of him, and I bought the exact same camera he had with the exact same lenses. And, then, and because I already had my studio, I had my lights, I had my equipment, I, I had free reign to practice. So when I look at my original pictures and I look at what I'm shooting now, there's a huge difference. But I had the luxury of being in my own space and, mm. and learning. So I didn't go to school for my photography. Um, you want to say I'm self-taught? Yeah, I'm self-taught. The only thing that I've, I've really took time to like, try to understand and learn and is lighting. If you understand, lighting is good. My phone, someone you know tried I mean? to call so, me. It's like, people don't see, I've been advertising. Why would someone call me now? I said, everyone, don't call me. <laughs> you, you can't get away from it. I'm going to have to lock off one person as well. But, <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, so 
once I started taking the pictures myself, then came my magazine. So the magazine was called Candy Man Beat Day. So yeah, Candy Man Beat Day was like an English version of Smooth or King, FHM, um, Urban. So again, we put that together, shooting that, and it was doing well. It was doing really well. It took, it took us three years before it started to blow. And where we really killed people was on online and the events. So we was having crazy parties, crazy events. Um, and it was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was amazing. It was amazing. I ain't gonna front. But in regards to a photography perspective, it was like people loved my pictures in regards to the composition, the lighting, and the rest of it. But a lot of companies and brands and people would be snooty because they couldn't get past seeing tips and arms, tips and arms, tips and arms. Especially mm. the black jiggly tips and arms, tips and arms. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I was getting feedback whereby people were like, oh, I really love your work, I'd like to work with you, but I can't be seen close to this stuff. So that made me think. So basically, Candy Magic was like six years in, and I was looking at the situation at the last stage of change. So Channel AKA had changed into Channel U, um, and it was grown, yeah? Um, in regards to the magazine business, so at the time when we dropped Candy Mag, there was Candy Mag, there was um, Leonard had a magazine called Flavor, but at the back of Flavor, he used to this thing called Eye Candy, then he set up an Eye Candy situation. Um, and then there was another guy who owned a clothes shop in Stratton called um, Dienzio. I can't remember what name of his magazine was, but he was doing something. Yeah? So here's another thing. When people talk about competition, I don't see nothing as competition. The way I see things is an industry. You understand? So it's like, when all those guys was doing their thing, it made sense to me. Mm -hmm. And what it did is it created a vibe, it created an energy. So remember, you're all chasing the same money, the same people, but you're just putting slightly different twist on things. So it's like, when we was doing our parties, they would come to our parties. Mm -hmm. When they were doing something, we would go to their thing. And this is how it's going to be. Video fixings, mm. they can't just be a video fixing in my magazine and done. There needs to be other outlets for them. It's so, so true. other people have to be doing stuff that, that's what breaks the scene. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So it's like when we started, it was vibrant, it was bubbling, it was, it was early, but people was funny. Then as we put in, and we was um, eight, nine issues deep, everybody else had vanished. So when everybody else vanished and we're just in the water by ourselves, it's hard to sustain and keep an industry growing. I'm bubbling when it's just you one. So then I started to think about all those people that like to work with me, but they mm -hmm. can't get past the chicks and us. So basically, I just done a shift. So the candy mag situation is still there. So for anybody that's interested in chicks and us, um, <laughs> what you never know is you go to Candy Mag on YouTube. It's all there. And thanks to OnlyFans. We now have Candy Bag only fans. Wow, that's so good. Yeah, so that's, that's there good. in the background, but that's not my main focus. So over the years, obviously, my photography started to get nicer, um, and a lot of people, I think, believe that all I was interested in was the arts. That's not who I am. That's not what I'm about. I did it because it's work. Yeah, and yeah. I had all the structure to make yeah. that work. But that's not what I'm about as a as a creative photographer. Don't get it twisted. There's nothing more beautiful on this planet to me than black women. Nothing. Hey. That's why when you look at my page, <laughs> it's hard to see anything other than black women. It's not because I don't see anything else, but if you're talking about me, that's my that's how I see it, right? So I said, okay, cool. It's time to step it up a bit. Mm. And that's when I got into the fashion, the editorial, the beauty and the hair stuff. Okay, so, so let's I'm move. Not, that wasn't too long of a rant, but you're up to speed now. Damn, do you know what? I'm not even gonna your you, your story is deep. I didn't even know you done all of that to get to There's where more, you are. There's more, but I'm I'm just skipping skipping through. But yeah, no. that, that's kind of in a nutshell in regards to where I've come from the different things that I've done. So you've got ghetto grammar, you've got cream the crop, you've got candy magazine, you've got Fagel model management, Jeez. you've got cerebral artist management, and now we're here from L Studios and Studio 77. So you know what you mentioned that at the moment you're Why doing. Why have you gone quiet? I've gone white. Yeah, I can't hear you that now. 
Can you hear me? Go on. Can you hear me now? Yeah, go on. I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Go, 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 go. Yeah, so you mentioned, I didn't know, so you mentioned that you're doing music management at the minute. So who are you looking after? You said, how many people are you looking after and how long, when okay, did you start so music management? Last year and the year before, mm -hmm. there, was, there was one particular artist mm -hmm. that kind of brought me out of music side practice. Man. Okay. So you can go check her out. Her name is Queenie. Queenie said so. So I want to put out the, the, the story yeah. behind me and her yeah. is that when I was doing the mentoring and 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 the youth work, um, you, I I met her then, so I knew her from when she was like thirteen, fifteen. So I was um, keep sorry Denise, I'm being distracted. My boy's telling me I didn't talk about the MC stuff. <laughs> okay, Dio, we got Dio all day, every day, blood house, basketball res. Yeah. <laughs> um, he wants me to chat about battling people and so on and so forth. Yeah, we'll get into that, maybe. <laughs> so basically, I met Queen from, from the mentoring stuff. So she's a young person that was on some of the programs that we were doing. And she was a bad person from early. She was killing people early. Um, but then she, she got into a situation and, and, and had a child. So when she had her child, it kind of put her, put her back a bit and she just focused on being a good mom and doing that stuff. And then recently she came back out and was like, yeah, she, she, she's fitting again. So I spoke to her, we got together and then we put together a project and that's what happened. So she was my only person that was moving out back to that. Because that's again, dope. the way I like to do stuff, if you're going to work with me, there's, there's different ways to work with people. But for me, I'm all in. And the problem with this whole thing is that when you're dealing with management, there's no guarantee. There's no guarantee that anything that we're doing up and up going to die and change will happen. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, we work, the last two years, if you check that stuff out now, anything um, last year and the year before, mm. I was all behind with that before. You know what I mean? But now it's like we kind of split ways a little bit. So I'm focusing more on, on what I'm doing on the photography and she's doing the music. Yeah, because you know what? It's kind of difficult. Uh, it's difficult when you're managing someone and then you need to manage yourself because that's what I've been doing all of my life. You feel me? Because at the right. moment I'm mentoring, I'm a mother. And then, do you know, you know when you've got so much things happening and then it's like, okay, I need to manage me. I need to do right. my thing. And I find it quite difficult. So absolutely for actually putting in, you know, like working with her. And it's, is, it, is it also because you used to be a mentor? Is that part of it as well? Yeah, it's a combination of both for me. Like, as a people, we often work based on relationships. Yeah. You understand? And, and understand what I'm saying to you. Understand what I'm saying to you. We as a people, we connect with each other and we work based on how we feel about each other. Yes. You understand? Yeah. Them as a people, you listening to me? <laughs> them yes. as a people, we can. They don't, it's not about the relationship, it's about the objective. So I'm trying to learn more in regards to not really doing certain things from an emotional perspective, mm -hmm. it's important, but it's like, what is the objective? What are we trying to achieve? If you're trying to achieve 2.6 billion, how do you get that 2.6 billion? And a lot of the times you're gonna have to be with people that you might not want to have dinner with or hang out with, but they're the same <laughs> people that are gonna help you yeah. because they have the resources or the skills to get you that 2.6 billion. And it's what I'm saying to you. Yeah, definitely. Whereas we, we're like, boy, my man didn't say good morning to me this morning, so I don't want to work with another one. Dead that. Because we're, <laughs> it's all about, it's about the relationship. So to answer your question, yes, the reason I got back into management is because I know her. I know where she came from. And mm -hmm. we had a solid relationship based on not even music. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then came the talent. So the talent was undeniable. Mm. You know so with the right people, this girl is supposed to be the biggest thing musically, because the talent is undeniable. But and, and then again, as a person, the relationship. So that's that's how I so I can see talent and know with or without me that talent is supposed to blow. You know what I'm saying? Definitely. But then there's the, the, the thing that a lot of talent doesn't understand is that relationship and hard work and 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 drive will beat talent by yourself every time. Yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, for real. Yeah, I, can I ask you a question? So how's COVID treating you? Because I forgot to ask you that question at the beginning. Like COVID? Yeah, like, as it affected COVID's you? COVID's treating me just fine. Remember, I'm going in. 
<laughs> so as a Ghanaian, I'm immune. I, don't, I ain't worried about COVID. <laughs> if you get me talking about that, they might knock off your channel, bro. So I'm not, I'm not really worried about COVID. So basically, when COVID started, I'd just gone to Ghana. So I went to Ghana in March, mm -hmm. um, the early part of March, with Eddie Lake Us, Mr. Magic Murray. So me and him went to Ghana. And then in Ghana, we was chilling. And then when it's time to come home, they was on some madness. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, like, it was like an apocalypse to us. So we thought we're going to come out of Heathrow and, like, everything's dead. The way that they were talking. So when we came back now, I was like, okay, cool. But for me, I haven't stopped working. I've been working. Lockdown, I don't know. Lockdown what? What are you locking down? Because <laughs> i got stuff to do. You know what I'm saying? So for me, maybe people are going to say, oh, you're irresponsible or, you know, you don't care about stuff. No, no, no. All I'm going to say about COVID is I'm going to move on because I don't want to get to it. Is that all you got to do is listen, do a little bit of research, come away from BBC News, come away from CNN, yeah? Um, and then you won't be so frightened. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because if Donald Trump can get COVID today, go to hospital tonight, and come out tomorrow, and he's cured, I'm good. I'm a shanty, so I'm all right. <laughs> You're a shanty. Oh, God. So do you know what? I want to ask about, because you mentioned it. Who, no, do you know what? You mentioned before about, you know, you shooting a lot of black women. But I want to ask you, who is your actual target audience? Because I see that your work's, but you've got a different variety style of work. So who's your, do you have a specific target audience? My target audience? Mm. It's a, it depends. So mm. by default, by default, I would assume and I believe that most of my followers of people of melanin. Okay. You understand? So most okay. people that follow me, and, and, it, and it's straightforward, it's just because I shoot predominantly melanated people. You get what I'm saying? Mm. Then there's other people that I'm seeing popping up now that have appreciated my work from a, from a creative perspective, an artistic perspective. So if you're asking me, me personally, who would I aim at? First of all, before everything comes us. You get me? Mm. So that's the first. But then, where I'm at now from a photography perspective, I believe that I'm at the stage now where I need to be seen as more than just somebody. You can't just come to me and book me to shoot your stuff like that. So I will do it. I'm a bit more fussy about what I shoot. Okay. Um, but I think all creatives need to get their path where they present themselves. So where I'm at now, I'm, I'm in a position where I'm, I'm looking at setting up some exhibitions you understand so for me if you look at my work and you talk about my aesthetic my aesthetic is colorful um if you want to use the word urban or black let's say black <laughs> so my stuff is colorful my stuff is black and my stuff is creative yeah so that's the stuff on 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 on, on, on my page predominantly, yeah? but then me as a person and what you will get from my Exhibitions is going to be more about social political commentary. It's going to be creative stuff, um, and I think all art, whether it's your stuff in regards to fashion um, or my stuff in regards to digital visuals, it has to be thought provoking. It has to it has to create an energy in someone. I want people to look at my work and feel something. I love understand. That. So yes. whether they feel what I wanted them to feel or they don't, but they must feel something. So that's 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 what it's about for me. So. My target audience is the world, mm. but only the world that can see through a brown tinted lens. Mm. You get me? <laughs> I love that. So, do you know what? I, what? So, what editorials like? What magazines? Celebrities? I know that you've done some award. Have you won an award before? I know you've done. Um, okay, awards. so it depends how you want to look at the award situation. So, mm. magazines. I'm regularly featured in magazines that I don't even know that mean because they never told you that. Your work is in it, but I don't know it's in it. So, standard stuff is like Hair and Beauty magazine, Black Hair, uh, Black Hair and Beauty, Hair magazine. Um, I've had some billboards done. I've had really? a shoot for a company called um, Oh Trader, which is a stock company. So they they've done billboard stuff. Magazine, and, and, and I'm sounding a bit shady because, to be honest with you, I don't really pay that much attention. Mm. If I'm being real with you. 
Somebody asked me the other day, somebody asked me the other day, like, oh, how do you go about getting editorials? As in publication. Mm. And I was like, to be honest with you, I don't really do that. And I, and I don't. I don't actually chase editorials. I don't chase magazines. I don't chase celebrities. So I've shot people like, uh, who's the more modern people that I've shot? Okay, people know Kojo. So Kojo, the comedian, I shot him a while ago. Mm. I shot um, the five star, Denise, Denise Pearson from five star. Oh shot, my gosh, I um, love Denise from yeah. The girl from M People. I want to say the name. Don't say the girl from M People. Oh yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. What have you done today to make you feel? Yeah, yeah. that one's name with a big head. I love her. She's but, so good. And then they come back to me. So I shot her. And people, the, the latest one, somebody asked me. And Someone said Dawn Richards. But Daniel they wanted said me to shoot, um, Tandy Newton. But how they was trying to get me to do it was, uh, I just didn't like it. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So again, me as a person, name doesn't excite me. I've yeah. shot the heavyweight champion of the world. You understand? Know so I've shot Deontay Wilder. So I know he lost his belt the other day, but yeah, I shot Deontay Wilder a couple of times. Um, but celebrity doesn't excite me like that. So when you become a work, I'm not doing your wedding. I'm not doing your baby party. I'm not doing your rain. Don't come to me for that. Um, <laughs> if you're a celebrity, I'm not coming to do it because you're a celebrity. If the concept is right and the situation is cool, and I'm going to get some money because you're a celebrity, I'm supposed to get paid, right? Yeah, definitely. I will do it. But there's plenty of things that I turn down because it's just not worth the headache. And, it, and I'm tired... I've, I've, I've gone past the stages of, oh, it's good for your profile, or or we're going to credit you. I'm, 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 listen, I have, I have a roof. I, I need to pay bills. <laughs> credit don't pay my children. Credit don't pay the bills. That's yeah, the for real, though. So celebrity doesn't excite me like that. And I've been around plenty of celebrities. But that's not, that's not who I am fundamentally. Do you know what you mentioned? Um, you mentioned before that you're very selective with your work. So if somebody comes to you and they've got a crazy idea, but they're going to pay you, and you, and you don't like the idea or the whole concept, you're not going to do it. Is that what you mean? Because that's what you said before. You know what it, what it is, Denise? This is how I am, right? And mm -hmm. anybody, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but it's real. And this is real, so I want to keep it yeah? Yeah. And this is how I am when it comes to work. First of all, if you come to me with an idea, and the idea excites me, then I'm like, okay, I'm in. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Obviously, the money has to equate to the idea. Yeah? And then sometimes, if I'd be totally honest, depending on the people, I might be prepared to pay for less because I know this is going to be a dope situation. Yeah. Okay? But then, I've shot for people whereby, and this is what people don't get, and, and, and other photographers, tell me if I'm chatting rubbish. <laughs> so, if now you go on my page mm. and you see all my work, I don't post nobody else's work on my page. Every single picture on my page is my work. I ain't posting nothing that I did right? Now, you see my work, and now based on my work, you come to me to book me. You get what I'm saying? So you book me now because you like my work. Mm. Now we're about to do the shoot, and then all of a sudden, you've got this person, that person, that person, all trying to direct and do my job. <laughs> I know what you're saying. You know what I mean, right? Yeah, when that happens, there's two things that can happen with me. <laughs> One, I can tell somebody I think it's a crowd, innit? Yeah? Like, leave me alone, let me do my thing, innit? You don't know who I am, let me do my thing. Which I don't do often. I more go to, okay, I see, I understand, no problem. And I be quiet. When I'm on a shoot, I'm somebody who directs. What a lot of people don't understand with um, photographers. There's different kinds of photographers, yeah? And somebody's taught me this not too long ago, a couple of years ago. I used to, I used to come up with a concept with a lot of shoots on my page that I'm the person that probably had it. I'm the person that put this together. I'm the person that shot it. And that's, that's it, yeah? But what I wasn't doing, I didn't use to give myself credit. So I never used to credit myself as an artistic director. I never used to credit myself as a um, creative director. I would just put my picture up. And mm. it everybody else. Mm. So what would happen is that people start thinking, oh, the makeup artist is responsible for that. And a stylist must have done that. And this is this, this, this. So then it downgrades me. Mm. So it's another photographer said, no, coach, you need to start telling, like, on your post, 
you need to start doing it where people know exactly what you've done. You yeah. get what I'm saying? So, if now I'm back to the client that wants to have their friends chatting a whole bag of rubbish in my ears, I then become quiet. If I become quiet, I will shoot like this and do what, exactly what they want, even if I know it's garbage. Mm. Because we're already in a situation and I'm not about to give you anything better than I can, but you're not prepared for me. You're not, and it's just, no, no I, I know exactly what you're people. saying. Yeah, because yeah, I, I but if you now, if you're a photographer that does direct, um, is creative because some photographers are not creative, some photographers are just um, technical. Yeah, whereas there's other yeah. photographers that you can bring them out an idea and they can embellish it, they can grow your idea. Mm. So for me, that's what I'm about. I like to be creative. So if you just let me pull things together and do my thing, most of the time it's going to be a bit nicer. So I will give you more than what you were expecting. I love that. Do you know what, what I love about everything that you're saying? Because you are self-taught. Where a lot of people yeah. that I've worked with, and this is a lot of people in general, they go university, they graduate, and do you know what I mean? They've, they've done a the whole shebang where you learn everything yourself in terms of the lighting, how to shoot. And um, have, you ever had a, can you, have you ever had a challenging moment? Have you ever had a time where you were like, oh my God, what am I going to do? I'm stuck. <laughs> and you, then you found a way of how to uh, overcome it. First of all, I think... Okay, so the, the, the things that can be challenging mm. is when, let's say you've got a particular kind of brief, and like in your eye, you're like, okay, I'm not talking about the first one, looking at you, what kind of light you and then I can work around that, you know what I'm saying? Mm. But if they bring me somebody else's picture, and let's say they bring me a shot of Beyonce, that you know to get that shot, they spent some heavy, heavy money <laughs> and had a heavy, heavy crew and team, yeah? Yeah. And now this person comes to me with an unrealistic expectation based on their budget and, what, and, they, and they want this. And I've got to now shoot as close as I can to that and make them happy, but it's not going to be exactly the same thing. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. They're the moments where I'm in my head I'm thinking, okay, how am I going to make this work? You get what I'm saying? So it's like, all creatives, we're, all of our time, we're, we're problem solving. That's how I look at it. Yeah. For me, Shooting on, on, on a shoot, it, 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 it. okay. So, this is a mood board, so that's a mood board. It's a mood, it's not exact, it's a mood. That's the first. Mm. So, now we need to create this energy with what we're doing, yeah. Yes, and then it's managing people and being able to deal with them. It's so yeah? true, so I love that. In one, one aspect, and then it's managing the equipment and all the rest of it. So, yeah, there's been times where in my head I wanted to look a certain way. And it, and it wasn't happening for whatever mm. reason. You get what I'm saying? And, 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 and people might not know that it's going on, but I know that it's going on. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. And then, to me, the most problems that I have on shoes really is, is, is people. I don't, you know what I mean? It, Definitely. Remember, on, on a big shoot, you've got so many different people, and there's so much different energy and noise mm. that you're managing that and still trying to focus on it's so true because a lot of times people always think that it's all it runs smoothly and it's easy but you know when you're doing a shoot sometimes you can get a crazy stylist and you've got the head and the makeup artist is taking forever then you've got the clients and you've got the management it's just crazy at times let me give um, you an example yeah i'm gonna shoot for um lusters you know lusters hair product pink had, you know, yeah. pink hair product so i've done a shoot for lusters not so long ago and i've shot for them several several times yeah mm. and Exactly what you're asking. So what happened is that they booked the day, they booked the studio, everybody mm. was on board, the team, everything was on board, right? Then they had three models that turned up for this shoot. And it was all natural hair for this shoot. So natural hair. Now, the models have gone up to hair and makeup. I I was downstairs setting up the, the shoot and getting ready for the shoot. Mm. And then they brought one girl down, one model down to test. So we tested, and then the, the hair team was just like, oh, you're not feeling it. And I'm like, okay. So the first thing that comes to me is, what is it that you're not feeling? Is mm. it my end? So if, if there's a problem with the light, is there a problem with the background, what is it? I said, no, 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 it's not that. It's the hair. We're not feeling the hair. I was like, okay. You know what they did? They canceled the shoot. They canceled the shoot there and then. So it's only like, an hour into the shoot. Are you serious? And nothing could be shot yet. What? They, they cancelled the shoot. 
a rebook for the following week. So they said, okay, we need to come back next week. How much are you going to charge to, to, to do it all over again next week? And we did it. And, then, and the second time now, everything went smoothly. And it was just because of the head. But did they I, use the I'm same not sure what it was. I don't know what it was. But mm -hmm. based on that, they cancelled it. So it's nice. like that can happen. But what, what everybody needs to understand mm. is that time is money. And you know as a stylist, it's like, mm. if you're on a location, and it's even worse if it's outdoors, because outdoors, sun is gone. You understand? So if you get cool to do a shoot, and you need to be on set for 6.30 in the morning, you need to be on set for 6.30 in the morning. Because once that sun comes up and keeps moving, keeps moving, keeps moving, if you haven't got what you need to do, you just wasted a whole day. For real, then. And that's a lot of money, a lot of man hours, and a lot of um, preparation. Yeah. You get me? But do you know, can I ask you a question? So they cancel the shoot, which I, I, I you could, you must have been happy. Like, what? I'm still gonna get paid. So did they end up using? Why didn't they just say to the hairstylist, "Can you just change over the hair?" I have no idea. That's but crazy. I respected them. Mm. I respected them for doing it. I'll tell you why I respected them. Mm. I respected them because they was like, no, they wasn't gonna get what they wanted from that particular head on oh. that day. So they'd rather cancel the whole day. Wow. Go back to the drawing board, refigure and come back. Then use the whole day. And now you're sitting on a bunch of images that you can't use or you don't like. So I have to respect them for that. For me, it was cool. Yeah, I got paid double, but I didn't get paid double because the type of person I am, obviously, I reduced. I said, no, I can't take money for the whole day for this. So once the, the main things are covered, my, my personal money will cut that. And then yeah. we'll come again next week. So that's how we don't. But can I ask you, did they, did they end up using the same hairstylist the next time when he shot when he shot the next week? Or did they change? No, to be honest with you, I think they switched one of the hairstylists out. Oh, I've got what to say. But I'm going to move on now. So, because you know, you, I had a whole bunch of questions, but you've, um, you've actually spoke about um, a lot of them. Can I ask you a question? So do you, what kind of models do you prefer to shoot? Do you prefer editorial? Or do you prefer glamour? Or do you prefer like commercial? Or even Instagram models? You know what? That's a dope question. <laughs> if you'd have asked me at the beginning when I first started taking pictures, mm -hmm. I just want a girl with the biggest bum and the biggest tits. <laughs> so the, 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 I need a wide angle lens and I just get this. That was at the beginning, yeah? <laughs> if you ask me now, very, very different. So now, I like, okay, my own personal preference, when I'm doing my own shoots for myself, mm -hmm. and anybody that's working with makeup artists, particularly will know this is one of my things that I always say. I like models that like aliens. So I, I like girls that look a little off, a little strange. But they're beautiful, <laughs> but they're a little off. You get what I'm saying? So from a face perspective, I do a lot of beauty stuff. So from a beauty perspective, that's what I, I naturally find myself drawing towards. Then, depending on the shoot, I want a model that, when you see that image, you believe it. Mm. That's what I'm saying to you. So mm -hmm. if, we're, if, we, if, if, if you now have gone out of your way to go to PR companies, and you've gone and got size six and size eight maximum elite outfits, one-off samples, if that is supposed to be on one way in Milan and, and, and New York, you've gone and done that. I don't want Shaniqua. Yeah, with the big bag, yeah, yeah, and the big tits, yeah. Who, yeah, she will look cool, but she won't look like that. Yes, I get that. There's yeah. a perfect look that I can shoot Shanique in <laughs> that is going to make her look the shit. You understand? So, what I'm trying to say is that I like all of them. So, I still shoot glamour. I still shoot glamour. Um, you can go to the OnlyFans Candy Mag. Only fans and I shoot for other um, only fans people as well. So I like glamour. Um, but when we're shooting editorial, I want it to look editorial. Yeah. And so as much as I don't chase magazines, I want people to look at my work and can visualize it in magazines. You understand? I want my work to be seen like, oh what is this is not being published, or was that in or, or whatever. I want mm. my work to stand up. So it's so important the models that we use. Because it, it makes your work look real, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. Do you know, oh, I want to yeah. go, so, you know what, when you say alien, is that for your personal work, when you say alien, 
looking kind of weird looking kind of yeah, girl. Yeah, for my personal work, I'm, if you look at my page, I've got some 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 nice beauty stuff, and it's like when you when you when you when you first look at the girls, if you take and this is another thing, it's like you talk about Instagram models. So this is a new career that has come along, but before they was called Instagram models, they was like IB for queens or, or I am for queens. Yeah, so what would happen is that you can see a bag of people on the road that looks fit or sexy or stunning. Yeah, um, see so your naked eye, but then you put them in the chair, hair and makeup, and you put them in front of the camera, and it doesn't translate, it doesn't come over. Mm. Then you can see another girl, and, and this is something that I've learned as well. It's like, you know, before you're like, oh, that girl just looks plain, that, that, you know, that, that girl, when you're dealing with more high end kind of stuff, you can't see it. But then their structure, their facial structure, their jaw structure, their phenotype, yeah, once they put that makeup on the little bit of hair and the lights on it, that girl transforms into something that you would never have seen before. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Definitely. So me, when I'm doing my own stuff, yes, I definitely have a particular look that I'm going for in choosing for my own stuff. You know what I mean? And then when I'm working for clients, there's two ways that I do it. Sometimes the clients bring their own models. Sometimes clients ask me to get models. So what I would do is I'll just put out a costume. And then, but the casting will go directly to the client, and then the client can choose the product. You know what I mean? But yeah, so I like black women. Yeah, I like to be black women. So how do you That's get lot. how do you get the women? Do you do you use like modeling agencies, or is it? Or do you, as you no, said, that's another thing. That's another thing. Yeah. So it's like it's funny because I've had a few model agencies over the years approach mm. me mm. to like want me to shoot their models. Mm. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. Um, but generally, to be honest with you, I put out castings. For so myself, I put out castings. Mm. So there's people I've worked with before that I'm happy to shoot again. But I'm always looking for that new person that face that energy. And it, and it just has to fit what I'm trying to achieve. You get what I'm saying? And, and it's as okay. simple as that. So I, I don't find it difficult to find a model. I like the idea. And this is, with, with the glamour stuff, what I really like about the glamour stuff is that I could take a regular looking girl that to myself, she doesn't even feel like she's all that. Yeah? Then I can get her in hair and makeup, you get the outfit, and then you shoot it. Then when you shoot that girl and you present that page, people are like, right, is she from London? What, this girl's in London? Yeah. I said, yeah, that one's from Brixton. That one's <laughs> that one's Austin. <Wilson. laughs> They're all local girls. Do you know what I'm saying? But you've never seen them presented like that. That was the beauty of the candy man. When they're doing the candy man stuff, like, regular. It was, I had all of these English girls that people are like, oh, you're going like that in London. Mm. Yes, plenty. But it's just that they never presented in a certain way. And that was the key. So for me, it was to get that MTV based kind of Americanized polished look, yeah. but with English girls. Yeah, and see, now, that's what I love. the Instagram models, if you want to call them that, mm. they've got that on smash. Yes. But a lot of those Instagram models, when you put them in front of them, professional camera in a professional setting they can't pull it off not all of them but a lot of them mm. because they're just used to doing you get me mm. i know exactly what you're saying so um who i mean who are you inspired by anyone like who do you get your inspiration from or is any Question. like photographers that you're inspired by there are but again to be honest with you i go through Instagram. Back in the days, I used to be on Model Mayhem a lot. I don't know. Remember Model Mayhem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I used to be on Model Mayhem all the time when it first came through. And I was like, yeah, I used to see a lot of photographers. Most of them was American and foreign photographers. Um, but where I didn't really study this, I didn't, I didn't go to school for it. So mm. I don't have the, the foundations in home. You must study David Bailey, and you must do it, Michael LaChapelle, and da 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 What I do is, I look at uh, this. There's one. There's one girl. There's a girl actually. I can't remember her name, but her stuff, an American girl. I used to love it. And then actually, I'm gonna make 